through a few announcements. Um, the remaining dates for our camp opening, uh, July 17th, this Tuesday night, we'll have the game night. July 24th will be our Amplify night. And August 7th is Red Carpet Movie Night. So if you were, were here last year, we had a lot of fun on the movie night. You don't want to miss it. Um, Amplify, our BBS for Neighbors with Disability, is July 22nd through 24th. If you're interested in being a volunteer, see Taylor. And today, at 2, we have a shop wedding show for Rachel and Gunner. A couple more before we do our welcome. We've got a set of keys that were left in the ladies' restroom. See me if they're yours. <laughs>
Sierra White, White. and today I'm going to be reading Psalms 96, 1 through 13. Sing a new song to the Lord. Everyone on this earth, sing praises to the Lord. Sing and praise his name. Day after day, announce the Lord has saved us. Tell every nation on earth, the Lord is wonderful and does marvelous things. The Lord is great and deserves our greatest praise. He is the only God worthy of our worship. Other nations worship idols, but the Lord created the heavens. Give honor and praise to the Lord, whose power and beauty fill his holy temple. <laughs> Tell everyone of every nation, praise the glorious power of the Lord. He is wonderful. Praise him and bring an offering into his temple. Everyone on earth, now tremble and worship the Lord, majestic and holy. Announce to the nations, the Lord is king. The world stands firm, never to be shaken, and he will judge his people with fairness. Tell the heavens and the earth to be glad and celebrate. Command the ocean to roar with all its creatures, and the fields to rejoice with all their crops. Then every tree in the forest will sing joyful songs to the Lord. He is coming to judge all the people on earth with fairness and truth. Amen. Let the glory and honor and praises glory.
Um, he was able to deliver a lot of those glasses, and so uh, they're working on how, how exactly they're going to distribute them. <coughs> Lately, they've been working on uh, their own mission compound. Uh, there's been lots of need to update those things. Uh, for a while, they didn't have water, they didn't have electricity, because of just how neglected the buildings have been, but with our help and the help of Quaker Avenue would love it, they've been able to update a lot of it. And there's still work to be done. Um, but in the meantime, just from this year, they were handing out solar lights to people, to refugees. There are three different regions around Sesame that those two missionaries were able to run around and communicate with. You know, a lot of these churches are, are just in villages. They don't have internet, they don't have cell service. And so their primary means of being connected with church groups around them are these two people. And so they were able to visit every church three times and connect with people, see what their needs were, uh, provide any kind of financial aid for them. Uh, there's been a lot of great work done, and they've also been able to encourage them to go to their surrounding villages and start churches and start communities. And since we've been able to help with them, 22 different churches have started um, in those areas. So I'm, I've been really excited about that. And with this new kind of bigger network of churches and communities, um, we have better eyesight on how we can help people and how they can help people. And so they're really excited about the eyeglasses. And um, I just ask for your prayer for this to keep going well. Uh, and last time we also talked, uh, Richard got in a bad motorcycle accident and was severely injured. Um, but he's doing great now. Thanks to uh, the human body and our prayers and people that have helped him, he's great. And so we thank God for that. Um, and so that was just a quick update. Uh, if you have any more questions, I've got so much information, I just couldn't put it all on a screen or anything today. Um, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I've got some photos that, to show y'all if you want to want to look at them. But uh, continual prayer for that. And so uh, if you guys would go with me in prayer, let's pray for those people that uh, Richard and Katie can reach. <clears throat> God, thank you for the connections we have. Thank you for Sean Tyler that uh, I was able to connect with him at school and. Uh, and that I found so many connections already here in Oak Ridge and things just came together. And thank you for Richard and Kennedy and their work that they do over in South Sudan. God, there's so many people that are in need. Um, there are so many people still fleeing from rebels and from violent conflicts. God, it's not easy uh, trying to figure out how to best serve people that we don't always understand and we don't speak their language. Um, so God, we thank you for the connections that we have, that we have people there that can see the needs and we can be a light and we can serve them in some capacity. God, we pray for those people. We pray for the refugees. Uh, we thank you for the amazing work that you've done. We thank you for the healing of Richard and we thank you for the safe travels of Sean and his team. God, we pray for all of those people. We pray for that country. And God, more now than ever, we also pray for our country in a time like this. Um, all around the world, people are, people suffer from violence. We just ask that. Uh, violence is not an answer in our arsenal for the problems in our life. May you bring us peace. May you bring us rest in your love and your presence. Amen. Go ahead and stand again. That's my heart to Calvary, where Jesus fled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. I say in the wrong, that cursed tree is body bound.
Okay, so, okay, so this morning I get this text. Can you help with Lord's Supper today? Like, uh, sure, why not? So, what, you know, ask, what am I going to talk about for Lord's Supper? What kind of devotion can we bring? And I guess like everyone, my first thought was, okay, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show forth the death of Christ. Okay, so that's, I was told that for my dad. He learned stuff from the King James Version. Yeah. And I was like, I was like a teenager before I knew what show forth meant. <laughs> and that's the way it went. To show forth. And did you know that it's spelled S E S H E W in the King James? Okay. That made, why isn't it shoe forth? Yeah. <laughs> That'd be different. And I was thinking about this a little bit. About the Lord's Supper. I came up with, with another verse I want to share. Uh, this is from the book of the small man to the sacred family in the village of Iron, the fifth chapter, verses 8 through 10, also known as Romans 5, 8 through 10. We read, but here is the way the maker of life proves how deep his love is for us. Even when we were still following our bad hearts and broken ways, the Chosen One gave his life for us. The lifeblood that he poured out puts our lives back into harmony and promises us good standing with the Great Spirit. What he has done sets us free from the storm of great anger caused by our bad hearts and broken ways. So, if the lifeblood poured out by the Chosen One has put us in good standing with the Great Spirit, then how much more will his life of beauty and harmony, which has defeated death, now set us free to walk in his ways? While we were sinners, Christ died for us. And, you know, you, you think about this. And we, when I was thinking about the passage, I was thinking about what we're, we're about to do. Uh, I had this, this, these thoughts about while we were sinners, <coughs> while we were against God, Jesus died for us and brought us back. And I just got to thinking, if, if he loved us that much while we were sinners, how much more grace, how much more love are we going to have as his children that we've been brought back to him? That's right. and, and it's just, for just me, it's a humbling thing to think about what it was that actually Jesus did while he was on that cross. This morning, the cross was locked up. What did Jesus do, you know, during those days that he was in the tomb and went and preached to those in bondage? And all this stuff that we have no idea what it is. Except that God so loved the world that he loved you. Me. That he sent his only son to die for us. I would like to think that I could, it would be very easy to find. I would take my 66 plus years, divide it by like 52, times it by 52, come up with some number, you know. But then I have to think, yeah, not every Sunday I do that. I didn't do that until I started when I was baptized, so I could take off the first. 12 years or so, 
I've been through college, all those times I overslept. <laughs> and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't have time. But today, I want today to be something a little bit different for me. Today, I want it to be something different for me. The reality that Jesus Christ was here on this earth and died for us is something that we all need to understand and take in our hearts. And the memorial service that was left for us to partake of does a very good job of that because when we do take of it, we do proclaim his death, his spirit was resurrection. We do proclaim that the body was broken, that the blood was shed, that the sacrifice was made for our sins, that we might be brought back to God, that he loved us in his faith and our, through our faith and his grace, we have our salvation and we're rescued. We need to realize the reality of that. Amen. And as we take the bread this morning, I want you to do something special. I want you to take it. I want you to feel it. I want you to touch it. I want you, if you want to smell it, smell it. Those of us that take the bread and break it, I want you to hear it as it breaks from the, that little piece that we have. And you hear the crack and realize the reality that the bread that is our fingers, the sound that it makes, the smell that it has, the taste that it gives us, the reality of that is just as real as that body that Jesus Christ had. It is just as real as the bones. Just as real as the flesh. And as you drink that cup, it is just as real, that taste that you have in your mouth, and when you see it in the cup, then you see it spilt a little bit on the trays as it comes around. That reality is just as real as the blood that was shed at that cross. And you drink it, and you taste it, and you smell it, and it's real. Today, we proclaim Jesus was real. And we proclaim his blood was shed, his body was broken. And we proclaim he died for us. And through his blood. I'm going to ask the shepherds and their wives, and the wives to go to uh, different parts of the auditorium. Um, this is a time that I think we just don't have very many visitors here. So this is a really special time. This is a time when we get to pray for one another. Um, if you need prayers for strength, uh, you can go to one of the shepherds. You can ask them. Uh, you can go to a friend of yours in the church and ask them to pray for you. If you know somebody that you believe you need to go pray for, you don't have to go do that. Uh, if you want to sit quietly and pray for people that are in your life that might not be here, uh, feel free to do that. Text someone. There's all sorts of ways that we can connect people with the presence of God this morning. And I think we're all fairly certain that our country needs the presence of God this morning. So we are the hands and feet of Jesus. We are the place where the anointing of the Spirit touches this world. Just like we believe the elements are real, we also believe that God is real. And we are about to enter his presence, talk to him, and ask him to change people's lives. So take that as a huge opportunity. Let's pray. Let's stand. <coughs> i 
Jesus Christ walks with us every step, and your Holy Spirit fills us up every day. Let us not be without hope. Let us not be without purpose. Every day, Father, when we rise, you've given us another day to serve you. Let us fill our lives with service to you, with service to the people around us. We look around us and we see people in need everywhere. Lord, give us purpose. Let us serve those folks. Let us know that they are your children too. Let us show our devotion to you. May you have all the glory for everything we do. Lord, all the prayers that have gone up from here, from all over this planet today, from all over our country, Father, answer them according to your will. Let us pray in your spirit every day. And Father, fill us up. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs> okay, well, it's time for our children to go to children's worship. They are on their way. They will bring uh, their offering to the front. We'll put them in this basket. Here we go. Got in the red basket. <laughs> and hopefully we get to sing the next song. Oh, there it is. <laughs> for appearing to you in video form, but apparently I'm still contagious with COVID. And I wanted to come to you from my little quarantine cell. We call a spare bedroom at my house. I think it's important that we finish the Book of Acts this summer. 
there is a reason why I chose to start the study of the book of Acts last year and, and continued it into this year. I want us to learn some important things about what it means fundamentally to be a follower of Jesus. What does it mean to be the church uh, for our time and for all time? And I think we serve ourselves well by going back and looking at the beginning. It's easy to think in times like this that we kind of have an idea of what's going on in our culture. But the truth of the matter is, historically, humans, as, as major tectonic shifts in culture have taken place, humans pretty much did not really notice what was going on until many decades, even a century later. I'm not sure we will truly understand in our lifetimes all that's occurring around us right now. That's why I think it's important for us to hold on to the truths that Christians, people who follow Jesus, have held on to for 2,000 years. And I think when we're studying the book of Acts, we have a tendency to get to, you know, past the Mars Hill sermon and past a couple of shipwrecks and, and, and we end up losing ourselves in the details and feeling repetition and tedium. And I want us to get past that. And so I'm inviting you into back into Acts chapter 22. Let me remind you where we are. We are standing on the steps of the Antonio Fortress. Now this fortress was built by the Romans overlooking the Temple Mount. This is where the Roman oppressors kept an eye on those pesky little Jews. And inside the Temple Mount, Paul has come to pray. While he's there praying, a group of Greek-speaking Jews who knew him from Asia Minor start a riot. And they carry him outside the temple and they want to have him executed. But the Romans come out of the Antonia Fortress and they arrest Paul and they're taking him back in for a trial when Paul speaks to the Greek commanding officer in Greek and asks if he can address the crowd. This surprises him and he turns and lets Paul address the crowd and he addresses his brothers in Aramaic, speaking to them in their own native tongue. And he says to them, I'm one of you. What I'm going to do at this point is put some note cards up that I think Paul might have carried in his pocket. <laughs> Thoughts that he outlined in his own defense. He says to the brothers, please listen to my defense. And he uses a word, apologia, which is a, the Greek word we get the word apologetics from. It's the word that means to make a formal legal defense. Paul is saying to this crowd, you become the jury, hear my testimony, and then judge me. And so he begins. And his first note card is full of points that emphasize the idea that I'm a Jewish Jew. You may remember that I've talked about the fact that Luke distinguishes three groups of people as he tells his stories in Acts. Oftentimes he uses the phrase Jews, and what he's referring to are Jews who speak Aramaic, who live in Judea and the surrounding area, who live culturally as Jewish people. And then there are the Greek-speaking Jews, those Jews who live in the diaspora around the empire, that who dress Greek and probably eat some of the Greek recipes, even if they keep kosher. And these are a different kind of Jew, though they can be very zealous as we can see from the fact that they've started a riot over Paul being in the temple. And then there's the Gentiles. But Paul seems focused on these Jewish Jews. He wants them to hear a message. And I want to say to you that I firmly believe Paul is not caught up in what is the big scale thing that's going on here. Paul Though I've told you, he does know he's going to Rome and he expects to be arrested and he expects to be taken to Rome under persecution. It is not Paul's attempt to convert the emperor and create a Christian empire. 
Paul believes each step of the way that what he's doing is making a difference in the lives of the people immediately in front of him. And I believe Paul is truly speaking to some in the crowd. Not that he's trying to win over the whole crowd and get out of trouble, but he's trying to speak to some in the crowd and get them to hear this call of Jesus on their lives. And so he goes. I'm a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in this city, that is Jerusalem. So Paul says, look, yes, I, I grew up and I've spent time in Asia Minor, but I, I grew up in this city. I know how to live according to the customs of our people. I was trained under Gamaliel, the famous rabbi, I understand this is no accident and no intentional effort on my part to corrupt the temple. I know what's going on. I'm one of you. In fact, I'm more than one of you. I'm one of your leaders. I know your leaders, your high priests and your elders, your council of elders. They gave me papers to go to Damascus to arrest more in the way. He says I was zealous I was zealous. This is the word used for Phineas, the, the priest, the grandson of Aaron, who drove that spear through the Israelite and his Midianite adulteress to demonstrate his zeal for God. This is the imagery Paul is conjuring, saying, I was zealous for God even to the point of persecuting the people of the way to death. And so he makes his plea to let these people know, I was on my way to Damascus. I was going up there to arrest people. I was going to bring them back for trial. Now, brothers and sisters, he, he wants them to understand who he is. He wants them to hear that, yes, some things have changed in his life. And yes, he has a different message than he had back then. But that he's been exactly where they are. And he is one of them. And then he goes on. If you uh, want to flip note cards, he moves to his divine encounter. Something happens that makes a change. He says, I was on my way. I was en route to, to Damascus. And when, as I got near to Damascus, right at noon, a very bright light shone over me. He said, I fell to the ground and I heard a voice Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? To which he answered, who are you, Lord? Now here's where some things begin to change in the story. Jesus answers him, I'm Jesus the Nazarene. Paul identifies specifically that Messiah was one of us too. In fact, he wants to make sure that the, he's not talking about that bar Jesus character, he's not talking about any of the other people named Jesus who have been rebels. He's talking about a particular Jesus, the Nazarene, that they all know who in recent years was executed. He says, I am Jesus, the Nazarene, that you're persecuting. And Paul says that the people who were with him saw the light, but didn't understand the voice, understand this, what the... Net Bible says, what it actually says is they didn't hear the voice. And that's a change from the way Luke told the story earlier in Acts chapter 9, where Luke says they did hear the voice, but didn't see anyone. And the Net Bible's trying to get us to understand that these people may have heard something, but they couldn't understand what it was, what was being said. They, they heard it, um, but didn't actually hear it. And this is, I think, a hint from Luke. Luke wants folks to hear, really hear, what Paul is saying. Pay attention. Something's being said here. And then Paul adds some detail Luke leaves out in chapter 9. He said, I asked, what should I do? You see, in this sermon, excuse me, not sermon, in this self-defense, this speech Paul is making, he wants the crowd and the people in the crowd, 
I would say he wants us to consider the fact that Paul knew because Jesus had interrupted his mission to arrest people who were following Jesus, that Jesus wanted him to do something about it. In this sense, he's not unlike Isaiah, the priest, who goes into the temple, and the temple is filled with the glory of God. And, and Isaiah falls and says, Woe to me, because I'm a man of unclean lips among a people of unclean lips. And God touches his lips via an angel who puts a coal from the altar on his lips and cleanses his lips and then says, I need someone to go and tell. And Isaiah says, here I am, send me. Paul is evoking imagery that comes from the call of the prophets, Isaiah and many others. Paul, the reluctant servant of God, on the wrong mission for God, realizes he's got another call here. And so Jesus tells him, get up and go to, to Damascus and you'll be told what you're to do. And, and he says, I couldn't see because of the glory of the light. Now, the Net Bible actually translates here because of the brilliance of the light. And you, you may have other things in, in different translations, but the, he, the Greek word here that Paul uses is actually glory. And that's a loaded word. It's the Greek word doxa. And he is saying to the people of, in front of him, I received a glorious divine call from God like all the other prophets before me. And then he moves on. He moves on to the answer to that question. Now before he does, he, he says that Another devout Jew, another Jewish Jew, who was well known and had good reputation for observing the law, that Jew came to him, baptized him, and sent him with sight to do the things God had called him to do. And then he returned to Jerusalem. And again, we get details in the story that aren't in Acts chapter 9. Paul tells us he goes to Jerusalem and he is praying in the temple. So he's in the temple doing Jewish Jew things, praying. Can it possibly be that the adversary would meet him in the temple? Could it possibly be that he is receiving a delusion inside the temple? In the temple. The Lord speaks to Paul, and he sees the Lord. He doesn't just hear. He doesn't just hear, but he hear hears. And he doesn't just see, but he see sees. The Lord standing in the temple, telling him to hurry and get out of Jerusalem. And this is where Paul's little speech takes a turn. The Lord tells him to leave Jerusalem because the people will not accept his testimony. And Paul says, but I'm one of them. I even persecuted people of the way. How can they not believe me? And Jesus says, no, go away. I'm not sending you to the Jew Jews. I'm sending you to the Gentiles. That's the point at which the crowd goes crazy. It is, of course, not just because he's going to the Gentiles. Pharisees and teachers of the law have been going to and converting the Gentiles for many years. Jesus refers to the Pharisees going over land and sea to make converts to the, to the way Jewish way of life. But then Jesus says, but you turned them into twice the sons of the Satan as, as you are. No, it's not that, G, that Paul would take a message to the Gentiles. It's that he would take a particular message. And that is that God is welcoming everyone into the kingdom. 
the kingdom has been opened up. So I think Paul does have a message, and I think Paul carries this message through the rest of the book, and we're going to point it out as we go through the details of the rest of the chapter. Here's what I want you to hear. This is what I want you to hear in the cultural moment we are in. There is a basic message. It may not ring with the cultural buzzwords of our day, with those, um, those words that are fiery and start controversy. But it's a message that if we hold on to it at the core of who we are, if we remember that it's at the basis of, of the kingdom of heaven that we claim citizenship in, then we'll pay attention to this message. Here it is. Through Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, Israel will be redeemed, restored, and renewed. And the second part of the message is this. The nations will be reconciled to their creator. You see, any good Jew understands that the story of God does not begin with Abraham. It begins with Adam. It understands that the story of God it tells of the scattering of the nations and the dividing of the nations among the gods. When we get to Abraham, we have the God selecting a people in order to make them a blessing to all the nations. It is God's plan to bring the scattered nations back together. And the prophets and the Psalms are filled with such stories. If we are going to be part of the crowd, we will be like those self-righteous people who sense no need of redemption, that we have the truth and we have the answers and we are the perfect ones. And if everyone else would just bow to our will, great. If not, we'll take them outside the temple and stone them. But if we will be the people of Jesus, if we will be the Jesus followers, our focus will be on a ministry that offers reconciliation to everyone, to anyone who will trust in Jesus. Brothers and sisters, our, our, our benediction reading this morning comes out of Romans. And I specifically chose the easy to read version because it uses the word trust where we typically have the word believe. I want to remind you that belief for Paul is so much more than just accepting a mental idea. The belief for Paul means trusting. It means living. It is belief that acts. It is belief that moves forward. And Paul is willing to be arrested, even stoned, even persecuted, even crucified or beheaded in order to carry this message that God is redeeming Israel and reconciling the nations to himself. We've got to remember that the call to us is to simply trust that Jesus knows what Jesus is doing and that he is leading us in this mission. And as the cultural winds shift around us, when we hear people around us calling names to their opponents, when we hear people around us criticizing the political policies of one group or the opposite, when we hear for cultural uh, war against people who live very different lives from us, people in the nations who, who don't understand God or godliness or the call to holiness, when we hear for people calling for war and for struggle and for control, this is not our call. Our call is to be followers of the one who gives everyone, everyone, the opportunity to call on the name of Jesus. And that's the extent of our ministry. May we be the people of Jesus, ambassadors carrying the call. I'm praying for us, Oak Ridge. I'm praying for us to not get caught up 
in the culture wars or the political wars of our times. But to remember, we are in fact involved in the ministry of reconciliation. And we will do that by reaching out in love and friendship to our neighbors. May God go with you. Please stand as Terry comes up, excuse me, Brian comes up to read this uh, benediction reading with us. And give him a hearty amen at the end of it. God bless you, Oak Ridge. If you openly say Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from death, you will be saved. Yes, we believe in Jesus deep in our hearts, and so we are made right with God. And we openly say that we believe in him, so we are saved. Yes, the scriptures say anyone who trusts in him will never be disappointed. It says this because there is no difference between those who are Jews and those who are not. The same Lord is the Lord of all people, and he richly, richly blesses anyone who looks to him for help. Yes, everyone who trusts in the Lord will be saved. <clears throat> At the end of the word holy, when we say this together, I want to pause for about 10 seconds. And the reason I want to do that is because this is the thing we need to be reminded of most out of this prayer at this time, I believe. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, may your name be revered as holy.